I thank you for spending your four-day weekend with us. A lot of my friends, a lot of churches canceled service today, but I had to get it in before the year was up. Look at somebody, tell them thank you for spending your four-day weekend with us. We love you. So, Father, we thank you. We praise you. We declare that there is no one like you, no one besides you anywhere. Now, Lord, we look back over this year, everything we've gone through, we thank you for bringing us to the verge of another year. We declare, like your servant Job, that you give, you take away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. It is our declaration that you have been good, that you are good. And now in ante eager anticipation, we declare that you will be good forever and ever. And so now, Lord, align our will to yours. And we'll give you glory for it. We'll give you honor. We'll give you praise. That you can give us a word in season. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If your Bibles meet me in Ecclesiastes, the seventh chapter. It's Ecclesiastes 7. Ecclesiastes 7. And when you get there, say something. It's going to take you a little bit. We, have, we don't go there often, so uh, the first few pages of your Bible, there is a table of contents. Look in there. Fine, Ecclesiastes, no shame in my game. The more you use it, the less you'll have to. In fact, in the Bible I had for most of my life, I had an alpha, the Bible, books of the Bible in alphabetical order just to make sure the preacher didn't have me turn into one. If you're still there, still turning, just open up your Bible to anywhere and look up at the screen. That's an old school trick. Ecclesiastes, seventh chapter. Beginning at the eighth verse. A word fitting for this season. The end of a matter is better than its beginning. The end of a matter is better than its beginning. Patience of spirit is better than haughtiness of spirit. Do not be eager in your heart to be angry, for anger resides in the bosom of fools. Do not say, why is it that the former days were better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask about this. Right before you take your seats, turn to no less than five people. Look them squarely in the eye and tell them, I believe my end will be better than my beginning. Tell them I. Come on, do with some conviction. I believe my end. There is an innate urge to reminisce, to look back in reflection on better days. Um, we even have a term for it in our society. We call it the quote, good old days. And in that statement, it is, it carries the idea 
that there are moments in time where things just seem to be better than they are right now. And in fact, there's a possibility that those days we reflect upon are better than the days ahead will ever be. We call them the good old days. You've heard me say many times, even if we didn't have everything we needed, we can look back. Sometimes you didn't have all the money you desired, but you knew how to have a good time. You could throw a picnic, and if you didn't have lobster money to put on the grill, you put on a good steak. If you didn't have good steak money, you put on some carne asada. <laughs> if you didn't have carne asada money, you put on hamburgers and hot dogs. Can I get a witness? And I remember it being so hood on some occasions that they would put lunch meat right on the grill. But, but even with that, we know how to have a good time. It's like the words of, as you heard me say many times, the vintage hip-hop poet by the name of Brother Ice Cube. He declared, no barking from the dog, no smog. Mama cooked the breakfast with no hog. And at the end of those sociological observations, he concluded that today was a good day. <laughs> he was still in the hood, still dodging bullets. But he can look back and declare that there are moments that we can freeze frame in time and say those were the good days. Interestingly, while we say that, there this instructor in Ecclesiastes encourages against it. As he, in the words of M.A. Eaton, attempts to enable the reader to overcome premature complaint. It's the picture of someone who's in a frustrating season of life, like many of you, on their journey. And they are chomping at the bit to talk about how unfair life is. And the, the teacher says, slow down just a moment. And don't complain too soon. You don't see the fullness of the ark or the journey that God has you on. Don't complain too soon. He addresses someone apparently wrestling through, through some frustration. And that's why I love the Bible. It's a real book. It helps us in our frustrations. Has anybody ever been, been, been frustrated? I love Jesus, but, but frustrated, full of his spirit, uh, but, but frustrated. Uh, you, you didn't even skip church, you're in church, but frustrated. Anybody frustrated right at this moment? Don't, don't lift your hand, just wink at me, and I'll know that you're in the building because there's a judgmental Christian sitting next to you. Listen in verse number eight to the subtle encouragement that there are better days ahead. Can't, can't you hear the exhortation in verse number 8 there? He says, the, the end of a matter is better than the beginning. If you read a commentary, it'll let you know this is probably Solomon reflecting back on his life as he has done it all, as he has seen it all. And now as he stands at the end, he speaks to someone who's still in the journey. And he says, listen to me. I know you're in a low place right now, but here's what I want you to understand. Number one, he says that the end will be better than the beginning. It's the idea of a progressive journey where as things move forward, there are ups and downs. But he says that God still has a plan and he has an end in mind for you. And as I stand at this end and look back at my journey, I declare to you as you're still journeying that the end, he says, will be better than the beginning. That's encouragement number one. Verse number eight, he says encouragement number two. Notice this, verse eight, part B. He says, patience of spirit is better than haughtiness of spirit. He says, because your end will be better than your beginning, even though you're stuck in the process, number two, listen to what he says. He says, chill out. Now, I don't know who I'm talking to, but there's somebody here who needs to know that you just need, need, need a little patience. 
Because there's frustration in the process when things don't happen as quickly as you expect them to happen. Or while you're still loving Jesus, doing everything you know to do, but the same calamity that falls on others falls on you. He says, listen to me, don't conclude you know what's going on just yet. He said, just give it a little time. He says, be patient. Don't irritate anybody, but just... Just in a subtle voice with a gentle touch, reach out to your neighbor and tell them, be patient. Yeah, I don't know what you're waiting on. I don't know what you're believing for. I don't know who you're dealing with. Okay, no amens there. You're sitting with them. Uh, but but just, 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 just touch them real gently, tell them, gently and tell them, be patient. Tells them uh, to be patient rather than haughty. Verse number nine, he says... Don't be so quick to anger. Listen to what he says. Do not be eager in your heart. Do not chomp at the bit to be angry. Don't, don't jump to conclusions too fast. He says, be patient and don't allow your present circumstance to frustrate you because remember my first word. He says, the end will be better than the beginning. And if you keep that in mind, if you are governed by that, if you know that there are better days ahead, he says, you could, number one, be patient, and you don't have to be as quick to anger. Some of us are hair triggers. And what has conditioned us to be that way is that God has been good. Ironically, God's goodness often is what produces our spoiled brat behavior, our sense of entitlement because God has opened up so many doors, because God has made so many ways, because God has again carved paths in the wilderness. The moment that he takes his time, we, we, we're quick. Hmm. Uh, it's a tough message today. To become angry. There is often a subtle arrogance. Here's the arrogance. When one assumes they know that God is done blessing them because they're at a stalemate in their life. He says, because your life has come for a temporary moment to a standstill or a stalemate, don't assume that God is finished blessing you the way that he's already blessed you. He says, don't, don't, don't be so quick to judgment. Don't be so quick to anger because you've assumed that God is done blessing you. At this point, we often conclude that the best is most likely behind us. Um. God sent me in this place to declare to you, do not complain prematurely because you have no idea what God is up to. There's a story by Rabbi Zacharias. I love this story. He says, one day there was a man who had a horse who escaped from his yard. And as the horse escaped from his yard, his nosy neighbor came up to him and said, hey, neighbor, bad luck. Your horse just ran away. The man simply replies, good luck, bad luck. What do I know? The next day, the horse came back with a bunch of other wild horses with him. The nosy neighbor came out and said, hey neighbor, good luck. All of these horses came back to you. The man simply replied, good luck, bad luck. What do I know? As the, his son was playing out in the yard with the horses, one of the horses kicked his son and shattered his son's leg, breaking his son's leg. And here comes nosy neighbor. Nosy's neighbor said, neighbor, bad luck. The horses that came over broke your son's leg. And the man simply replies, good luck, bad luck. What do I know? The day after that, there was a band of bandits that came through the town. 
there was a violent war. They were looking for someone to recruit, to pull into their war by force, to fight in this violent war. But as they came for the man's son, he couldn't fight the war. They couldn't take him away because he had a broken leg. The man, the nosy neighbor, comes back over and said, my friend, good luck. Your son, because his leg was broken, could not be taken over into this war. The man simply looks back and said, good luck, bad luck. What do I know? The idea is that we do not judge prematurely what God is up to. When we're quick to anger, we assume because we didn't get the immediate promotion. We assume because there's re relational frustration that somehow God has forgotten about us. But the writer reminds us that we should not judge God's, our journey with God prematurely. Look at somebody, tell them, don't judge prematurely. Yeah, don't judge prematurely. While the verse number 10, our focus verse has its own revelation, or all the verses have their own revelation. Verse number 10 yields an unusual insight. Listen to what verse number 10 says. Commands the reader, do not say, why is it that the former days are better than these? So here's the idea. There's an individual frustrated in their current predicament. And so because they're frustrated in their current predicament, they look behind them and begin to live in their mind and in their hearts in the good old days. The writer comes on the scene and says, get out of the good old days. Because while you're living in the good old days, your God is not finished with you yet. Now, now, I know many of you don't need this because everything is working out in your life. You just got three promotions on your job. You bought your family everything that they desired for Christmas and had an abundance left over. There's everything in your relational relationships with your friends and your family and your nuclear family and your broader family is completely on point. So you don't need this. But there may be someone who sitting next to you who needs to be reminded that God is still up to something. That their best days are not behind them, but their best days are before them. Look at your neighbor real quick and tell them don't judge too soon. Yeah, 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 yeah. He says, don't look behind you. Um, my question is, isn't it fair, particularly in difficult times, to remember when? Why, why won't he let them remember when? When money was better. Mm, remember when? Uh, when life was simpler. Oh God, remember when? Your kids are so ready to become adults and to get good and grown, and you try to let them know, take your time. You don't want these grown folk problems. Remember when relationships were easier. Okay, nobody human in the place. Remember <laughs> when, God, I wish I had time to work this, uh, your children were respectful. Remember when parents were dignified. Remember uh, when you were really in purpose. I mean, you were really living for God. Remember when you, you really walked with God as a man or a woman walks with her friend. Remember when ministry was really on Fire. Remember when music was, was good. I, I knew. Yeah, yeah. Re remember. 
Remember when the world was a better place. Remember when everything was so much better. Oh, I'll holler back at your boy real quick. Uh, but interestingly, God through this text is not trying to reign on our retrospective parade but instead reminds us not to glorify the past as if he is done moving right now. Touch someone, tell them he's not finished with you and wants to give you some things, uh, not just to remember, but God wants to give somebody in this place some things to dream about again. You've been looking back, going back down memory lane, and God is trying to pull you into your prophetic destiny. Touch somebody, tell them, God wants to give you some things to dream about again. You've stopped hoping, you've stopped believing, you've stopped dreaming, you've stopped thinking about the prophetic possibilities. God does this because almost there, he knows, God, I wish I had time to work this. I'm going to get in somebody's business real quick. He knows that we have a tendency to glorify the past. And because we have a tendency to glorify the past, we inevitably get stuck there, he says. Do not say, why is it that the former days were better than these? He says, stop it. Shut up. Cease and desist. Stop moaning today about the fact that the former days were better than these. Because as you look back and celebrate the former days being better than these, what ends up happening is you get trapped in the former days. You're like Al Bundy sitting on his couch reminiscing about his days at Polk High. He feels like he just stepped off the field and it's been 40 years, Al. Get up off the couch. Say goodbye to what has been and think about the possibilities in your life. Look at your neighbor, tell them don't get trapped in the past. <laughs> Glorifying how good it was. Shoot back when Antioch. <laughs> and you fill in the blank. How good it was back when we first met. How good it was when we were all kids. I don't know where you are, but you will never be. <laughs> Kids again, man, you ought to get closer than that, man, because I may feel like preaching in a minute. You will never be kids again. But I'm trapped back there because of the difficulty right here. I, I have glorified my past. Can I do a little work real quick? Crystal Downing in her book, Changing Signs of Truth, calls this glorification of the past. She calls it, ready for this? mystifying and I discern in my spirit and it doesn't take any prophetic insight that there's some people in this room who have been mystifying your past it is, was so glorious but can I help you can I demystify what you've been mystifying the past was so great. She suggests that we mystify whenever, here it is, we idealize the past or create a smokescreen that covers over the actual problem. So in society, we can mystify things as if this is the worst generation and every other generation that has come before us was so much better. But can I tell you that every generation that came before us complained about the same things we're complaining about. 
Technologies allowed things that it has not, have not happened before, but the human condition and human depravity in many respects, whether it was overt or covert, whether it was in the public square or sneaking around corners in biblical days, it is the same human condition. Can we demystify what you have mystified in society? Now listen to this critique in Signs of Times by Thomas Carlyle. His critique of culture, he writes, public principle is gone. Private honesty is going. Society, in short, is fast falling in pieces and a time of unmixed evil is come upon us. Sounds like the days we're living in, doesn't it? The only challenge is Thomas Carlyle wrote this in 1829. Uh, we look back and say it was so good, but we mystified the past. Thomas Carlyle looks and said in 1829, society is so terrible. It was better back then. I love it. Tom Brokaw cites in the apparent, cites the apparent superiority of the time period and the people who live, the superiority of the people who live between the Great Depression and World War II in his book, in quotes, the greatest generation. However, however, while family values and heroism were at an all-time high, nationally sanctioned racial discrimination was off the charts during the greatest generation. Are you still here with me? During the war, German prisoners were able to go to movie night while African-American soldiers who fought in the war couldn't even get in the building because of their skin color in the greatest generation. Are you still here with me? In the greatest generation, there were stories of U.S. sailors stealing watchers and wallets off of the deceased bodies of their fallen fellow soldiers at Pearl Harbor. Oh, they were rascals back then too. But we have mystified generations past. In 1919, Congress voted an 18th Amendment banning the sale and transportation of alcohol. However, a year later when it passed, both congressmen and senators were buying what they banned from everyone else. Are you still here with me? This does not only happen in society. We mystified we remember all of the good while forgetting all of the bad and the challenges, but it happens in our Christian faith. Look, listen to the words of Martin Luther as he laments about his own time in the 1500s. So in the 1800s, they were looking back and saying, remember the good old days, the 1500s? In the 1500s, Martin Luther says, in our age, in these dregs of the world, there is such great wickedness and there are such manifold instances of fraud and deceit that you do not know what to do for anyone. He then states of the Old Testament time, there was such a large number of vagabonds and scoundrels in our world uh, today, but not in theirs. And my question to him is, did he read the Bible? They were just as crazy, jacked up, and wicked back then as they are right now. Read the book of Judges. But here's what happens. We mystify the past. Pull Pulling out all of the great things while forgetting the challenges, forgetting the wickedness, forgetting the drama. Enough about society, enough about the Christian faith and how we do that there. Let's just talk personally. In your life, he says, don't keep looking back. Stop saying that those were the greatest days because we, just like everyone else, have the tendency to miss 
rectify all the great things that were going on in the past, we have the tendency to personally lament over our present while mystifying the past. I got to work this, but we got to go because y'all look hungry. Let me help you real quick. We had back then, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but it's what you already know, both good and bad, just like you have right now at this moment. We had back then both opportunities and challenges just like we have at this moment. We had back then in the good old days open doors and closed doors just like we have at this moment. But because we've mystified it, we've demonized today while we've celebrated yesterday and the challenge with that is we no longer have sight of the goodness of God for our future. That is why the writer says stop saying today that those were the good old days as if God is done with you right now. Look at your neighbor, give him a high five real quick and tell him the best days are not behind you but the best days are before you. It's just that yesterday's victories and today's challenges are always maximized while yesterday's struggles and today's blessings are always minimized. God, let me say it real slow because I, I know it's the holiday. Let me say it real slow. Uh, it's just that. It's not that yesterday was greater than today is, nor is it that yesterday is better better than your tomorrow will be. It's that yesterday's victories and today's challenges are always maximized. While yesterday's struggles and today's blessings are always minimized. So you have yesterday's victories clearly retained while the challenges of yesterday are a fading memory. While today's challenges are eclipsing the recognition of today's blessings as well as tomorrow's hopes. God, let me see if I can make it even more plain because we're ready to go. Uh, let me break it down. You remember how romantic your previous relationship was, but you forget uh, how you constantly had to question their fidelity. Where did Rick go? He went to the bathroom, Lisa. He'll be right back. I wish I had time to work this like I wanted to. You recall how you walked with God then as if it was glorious, but forget how you still were engaged in some foolishness. Think hard. You mystified it like you were walking on clouds back then, but you still had missions going down if you think hard enough back then just like you're wrestling through it right now. Look at your neighbor. Tell them stop mystifying. You celebrated how good the money was, but forget how miserable you were. Tell somebody, stop mystifying. You're stuck on the shape you used to have back then, but you have no sense. You forget that you had no sense to go with a bad body. God, I wish I had time to work this like I wanted to. You remember how much freedom you had to do whatever you wanted to do. But forget how many nights you prayed, God, if you let me get out of this, I will never... God, I wish I had time to work this. Do this again. Give somebody a high five. Tell them stop mystifying. Stop looking back and remembering the glory without remembering the challenge. Uh, you remember the party without the hangover. You remember the promotion without the haters. You remember the pleasure without the horrors. But let me take you down memory lane. You had both good and bad, but you reach back 
and simply remember the good. I'm not saying that it wasn't good, but I am saying that you need a sober view so that you can move out of yesterday in preparation for tomorrow. Who am I talking to? I need some people that have been living in your past, stuck in yesterday, fantasizing about how great it was. God sent me in this place to declare that the one who did great things back then is still able to do great things now. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we ask or think. Give somebody a high five and tell them not just what he did, but he is able to do do some things. He is able to turn your circumstance around. He is able to reconcile your relationship. He is able to make a way out of no way. He is able to produce hundreds of thousands to close a real estate deal downtown. He he is able uh, to do more than you ask or think. Tell somebody, tell me if you can think about it, he can do it. I need you to get your faith back up. Somebody in this place uh, is trying to date their destiny, but can't break up with their past. God sent me in this place to declare it's time to, to break up with your past. Yeah. Your past appears to be sexy, but it beat you too. Uh, your past attempted to be favorable, uh, but it disappointed you too. Uh, your past brought you roses, but it didn't always come home. It's time to leave your past for your destiny. Give somebody a high five and tell them I still have. a destiny. Tell somebody there's still a call of God on my life. And I declare that God sent me in this place to tell you I will do a new thing. Touch three people and tell them new, 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 new. I'm here to do a new thing. I believe that my ends will be better than my beginning. In fact, prophesy to somebody that your ends will be better than your beginning. I don't how, care how low you've been. I don't care how depressed you've been. I don't care how stressful your years been. God says that your end will be better than your beginning. Give somebody a high five and tell them I'm going up. I don't know when, I don't know how, I don't know the season, but what I know is before it's set done, before it's over, before the jello jiggles, before the mustard's off the hot dog, tell them I'm going up and it will be better. Better than my past. 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 Is there anybody who believes that what God has for you is better than where you've been? Then give God a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God is turning it around. Hallelujah, he will make a way. Hallelujah, hallelujah. They meant it for my evil, but God's working it out for my good. Hallelujah, there are more open doors. Hallelujah, there will be seas parted. Hallelujah. Lift up your head. Lift up your head. Lift up your head. Oh, ye gates. And he lifted up the everlasting doors. King of glory. 
more said and done, God, there'll be more with you than you could even and ever imagine in the middle of your discouragement. I know it's hard to believe. I know it's hard not to look back, but to look forward, God said.
believe again. God, we claim that our end will be better than our beginning. I pray for the person in this place that has become angry, that has become bitter, frustrated, impatient with the Lord. I pray, Father God, that you revive, that you refresh, that you reinvigorate Tomorrow.